when we think about that cough, right, we're really working on the right stuff. And so I get the good fortune to interact with a, with a lot of veterinarians, and, you know, it's, we always say, this, well, how the pigs were coughing today, right? And so we went out there and we posted pigs. And so is that really where we ought to be chasing, or should we really think about how we think about controlling mycoplasma in other ways? So why are we talking about, well, one, PRDC is still a big deal. I'm playing a little bit in the cattle world today. Um, which is a whole different game, but not different. But the key thing there, and it's really helped me to understand, is that it's mixed respiratory infection that we need to think about, not single agent disease. The other thing that's very helpful working in feedlots is they, they don't get very excited when cattle get sick. They expect it. And I think there's a healthy bit of that as in pig world that we need to have our caregivers think about and that we should expect sickness and look for it every day and not freak out when it happens. Secondly, we don't really have tools to optimize our management of it yet, and we'll talk a little bit about that and where we miss that at And the Cattle Boys, although we'd like to think they're behind or ahead of us in a lot of ways there. Secondly, you know, we talk about PERS, but we've got all these other complex interactions that go on in that lung that we don't understand very well. It's where maybe talking about single agent studies and controlled research barns doesn't help us a lot as we think about what's going on in that barn because you know, they might be at 6.2 square feet with bad ventilation and four, four infectious agents, et cetera, et cetera. And so how does that all play together? And then really, this is the deal. We don't really have a lot of good current data. There's some studies out there, but, but it's not a really deep feel like we've gotten PERS to help us move through. And then I think where we confuse our producers is, is that if there's 150 people in this room, there's probably 240 approaches to handling this, and maybe not all those put together. So let's talk a little bit about SRD, and, and again, it's this complex. SRD is kind of what happens, right? So we think about these big agents on the corners, and we can identify those fairly easily, and we can fairly easily rule out if they're present and what role they're playing. Then we've got these orange boxes that are a bit of a mystery, right? I mean, what happened environmentally, we don't understand that very well. We don't really understand how to measure that efficiently at the level of the slat. We've got this caregiver skill thing. Maybe it's caregiver presence. Maybe I should put that in there. Did they even go to the barn today? So we've got this huge caregiver impact that we don't understand at both the south arm and the pig level and what impact it has on the expression of SRD. What are we doing with respect to mixing? And how does that happen? And what agents are we bringing in? And then this little booger over here called Hyotomoniae, and what role does it play? And I am, will admit right now I'm a fully blown skeptic. Is mycoplasma something we find, or is it a primary driver of disease? And I don't think we know that. And I don't think the data really tells us that, because I'm not sure we're looking in the right place. And so that's where we're at. So let's think about what happens on a typical day, right? Phone rings. Some finishing guy says, Doc, these pigs are coughing. Make it stop. So what do we do? We run out to the farm. You know, maybe even the same day, because we're like super vet, and we fly out there in our pickup truck. Send them to the lab. Oh, we had to throw them on water meds, because they ain't getting better if the water meds ain't clicking. Right? We've all been there. Three or four days later, we get some diagnostics back, and they're mycopositive and PERS and SIV and ASUS and blah, 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 blah. Right? We find a mycopositive PCR with maybe some cuffing of the bronchioles and go, well, we must have a myco problem, so what do we rationally do? We change something like vaccine. We've all done it. I've done it probably three times this week. Right? This is what happens. This is our clinical world. Well, the question is, is that right? So let's talk a little bit about respiratory disease complex and what happens in the individual critters. So we're going to talk about the individual critter for a minute, then we're going to talk about populations. So an individual pig to orient you, this is kind of a mount severity. What do you want to have on this axis? And this is time. And so if we think about it, right, we get this nice this little blue line is the viral load. So we get this nice big viral spike. Following the big viral spike, is this peak in, in macrophage activity, right? So kind of the innate immune response, there's T cells and macrophages carrying on here. And then sometime after that, fairly distant time after that, we get this rise in bacteria. And so that's, you know, whatever, pick your bacteria. And then after that, we get this nice rise in neutrophils. So what does that really mean? Well, it means that as we get this peak in activity, we get this mass release of cytokines, interleukins and, and tumor necrosis factor. And those things are pretty potent stimulators of sickness behavior. 
So what do we think about with sickness? Well, we talk about, you know, I don't want to get up. And it's like when I felt like three weeks ago after going on some silly cruise, yes, I wash my hands. You apparently cannot wash your hands enough. Okay? So like three days after that, I felt worse than worse could be. Right? I was inappetent, which I could afford to do more. Right? I wanted to go to bed. I wanted to sleep. I didn't want to get up. I didn't want to do anything. Well, if we go look at our pigs, or we go look at calves, or we go look at the dog, or we look at our kids, or we look at ourselves, that same thing happens. And that happens because this initial response to infection is this massive release of cytokines. So what does that result in? Well, if I think about it, viral rise, and I'm going to put this blue line on here, sickness behavior. There's this massive peak in sickness behavior that occurs long before we see weight loss, right? Sickness behavior means inappetence, means I'm depressed, I want to lay in the corner. So the result of that is weight loss. Well, think about how do we normally identify sick critters? What do our caregivers do a lot? Yeah, who's got their backbone sticking up? Who's got rough hair? You know. So here's an interesting fact you have to kind of put in the back of your head. The average infection to death interval in most respiratory diseases is in excess of 30 days. They are sick, they act sick, they don't die for 30 days. Sure, there's ACEs cases, they die fairly quickly. But there's a long interval between infection and death. And if we think about it most of the time, our primary marker of identifying respiratory disease is death, and then we go cut up in the dead pile. Hmm, then we send that stuff to Darren. Say, hey, buddy, figure this out. And then we're pissed when it doesn't work, right? So if we think about that, there's this interval of days that our ability to detect disease and actually figure out what's happening are very, very different. So how does that relate? Well, let's talk about SIV. This one's really simple. It's really easy. Right? This is where we're going to use terms like the reproduction ratio, R sub naught, and all those really fun terms. Dale, no comments. Just calm down. Okay, so let's talk about this. So if we make this kind of assumption that there's a gap between sickness behavior and, and expression of disease, and in the case with influenza, it's, it's flu, or it's cough. And so that cough occurs three, four, five days after that initial infection, right? If you think about it, when you get flu, you just feel awful those first few days. The virus really hasn't replicated a lot. You haven't started sloughing those, those lining cells in, in, in your airways, and so there's no mucus production. You're not sick yet. You don't have anything to cough up. So if I think about that, so I get this outbreak, right? So here's the outbreak. Here's the number of infected critters. It trails by about 24 hours. So I get one index case over here. I trail along. So I get an index case at day zero, right? I get a three-day lag. I got two cases now. And all of a sudden, I finally infect the whole population and it falls off. Well, this cough thing lags by about three or four days, OK? So if I think about this timeline, we've got some really interesting work that we did taking a microphone in a pig barn and counting coughs. And there's some IT guys and engineers that think this is really cool. So they sent in and figured this out. So we can electronically count coughs. So we said, OK. And it was a recent research barn. So the peeps in the barn said, hey, we got sick pigs. OK. Are they coughing? Yes. So we went back into that tapes that we had of all the barn and picked it up. And it's about 20% of the pigs are coughing before our brain will let us hear that because there's some background noise all the time, right? There's always some kind of cough. And the other thing is, much like us, they cough more when they get up first thing in the morning. So if I wasn't there at daybreak, when they naturally get up at daybreak, there's more increased coughing activity. And so there's a lot of sickness before we see it. So if we think about that, that means like three days before that 20% were sick. It means the first pig coughed basically a week before that. The first pig acted sick almost two weeks before that. And that index case was almost two weeks ago. So this is flu. This is pretty simple. I'm talking about a two-week timeline. But we're two weeks behind the infection when we said, oh, God, they're coughing today. Okay, so let's take it to the next one, which is mycoplasma. Now, this is the same kind of mass, so we've used the reproduction ratio out of the literature. And I need to tell you, this is all based on experimental infections. We had negative pigs, we put a cedar pig in the barn, 
those pigs were allowed infection to happen, and they measured this over time. So if we kind of use our similar coughing index here, right? So at some point, we're going to pick this up here, 66 days or so after infection. We basically have got this expansion of the infection curve, right, prior to that. So we're 66 days after infection in a known infection model before we're probably going to observe the effects. So if I'm out here posting pigs and I've got mycoplasma, was that the driver? Or we just find it? Okay, so here's the timeline. We got pigs coughing. We're 66 days after infection in an experimental model when we're probably going to let our brain hear that. When we look at some real-world data where it's hard to calculate reproductive ratios, but we know the reproductive ratio in the real world with antibodies and vaccine and everything else going on is different. We're probably 100 to 150 days after infection, after the barn was significantly infected before we're going to hear that cough. So the take-home is I'm going to really struggle to understand what's happening in the barn if I'm looking at something 100 days after it happened. I would suggest if we're necropsying pigs and drawing a lot of conclusions out of that, we may be significantly looking in the rearview mirror. Okay, this is what we've talked about here. 6 to 20 days and then 30 days to death, and that's a number you need to put in your head. This data actually holds. It's actually in the cattle world something because we know when they were pulled and treated, we actually monitor. And when that interval starts getting shorter, we don't assume that the disease is worse. We assume that the dudes pulling the cattle are worse, right? We're finding them in a more chronic state because that's a fairly fixed biological activity, okay? And then let's think a little bit about where we're at with endemic diseases. One, what do we do? And we've talked about PERS and we can monitor that and we understand it. Two, influenza, we could monitor. We don't know how we can control it. We don't really understand its transmission. There's a bunch of work going on today, but that's interesting. And then we get to our friend, Mr. Mycoplasma. And we say, we don't have a great way to monitor that. We got bad diagnostics or at least inefficient diagnostics, right? Technically, the test is great, but the bug and the test don't match. So it's really hard for us to say, ah, this is what's going on in the sow farm and think about the sow farm. So we keep getting these results in grow finish and we're hammering on that, and we stop dope because we can't prove it at the south farm. We struggle to say, oh, what role is that? Is this breeding herd really playing across the system? So, of course, the answer is use more vaccine, right? So I think the question is, it's not how do we use more vaccine. We've got to understand what role vaccine plays in this whole management and where are we at. So let's talk a little bit about what vaccine does, and I think this is important. One, it improves clinical signs. Clinical signs is cough and growth rate. And number two, it doesn't stop transmission. It maybe alters it, but it doesn't stop it. Not shocking for a killed bacterial agent, right? Okay, so where does that put us? I said we don't have a lot of data. And if we think about making good decisions, we really ought to do that in an evidence-based manner. And as I look at where we're at today in this whole field of mycoplasma management, we got a lot of this. Maybe we'd cross that expert. We got a lot of opinion, and we ain't got none of this. We really got nothing on the highest level of standard. And if our friends in the human medical community were making decisions, they just won't do anything without this. So we have to work down here. We've got some of these control lab experiments, which as we look at those, they may not hold up. We'll talk about that in a minute. But as a community, there's a lot we can do to improve our own standing of this and how do we actually go forward. So why does it matter? And, and I think this is it. It is a high cost, high risk business today. And so we've got more risk as veterinarians in, in, in making sure that we're making decisions that actually generate the right kind of profit for, the, for, for our clients and the producers. We have highly technified, highly sophisticated production owners today that understand their economics, they understand how their systems operate, and they understand where the gaps are. If we can't provide evidence-based, repeatable, science-based solutions that are measurable over time, our role as veterinarians will be diminished. I'm not saying that to scare you, but I'm, I'm 
saying that to say if we want to be for the good of profession, we have to get to the top of this chain. We have got to get to answers that we know are repeatable and doable over time because of the amount and expense that we have with our pigs. And I think there is some evidence to help us make better decisions. So let's talk about that. We're going to talk a little bit about the evidence that's out there today and try to talk about what this role of vaccine is. So this is uh, some old work out of, out of Europe, uh, out of Mays' lab in Europe. But in the back, you don't have to read this, but basically they vaccinated these pigs in a transmission study. It reduced cough by about 50%, so 50% fewer days coughing in the vaccinates versus the non-vaccinates. And lung score was reduced, or the percent involvement of the lung was reduced by about tenfold. Okay? Okay, we got a reduction in clinical signs with the vaccine. Didn't make it go away, but we got a significant reduction. When we looked at transmission, so the same study looked at transmission, and I didn't make this big because there's no point, the transmission rate in vaccinated and non-vaccinated pigs was equal. The R sub naught was equal. So no change in transmission, but individual improvement in pigs. That's important as we think about driving that forward. Okay. So then they looked at it under field conditions, and there's a couple of meanings to this study. So this is a, the same lab, Mays' lab, and they looked at, at BAL positives, or bronchiolage PCR positives, and this is prevalence on this axis, and this is the age that they sampled these pigs. And see, these are the vaccinates, and these are the non-vaccinates. The blues are vaccinates, and the reds are, or oranges are non-vaccinates. So there's two things to note. One, there's a real difference in prevalence at weaning, and these were matched in the same litter. But the slope of this line, i.e., one infection at weaning was 1.56 infections at, at nine weeks of age, was constant with or without vaccine. So we had more infection here, we had a lot more infection here, but the ratio of those slopes the ratio of those columns, i.e. the slope, is identical. So vaccine didn't change it. But look what happens when we have a lot of infection at the time of weaning. We have a lot of infection early. So if we think about that time delay from cough to sickness to disease, if I have more infection at the time of weaning, I'm going to have earlier infection and so these blue pigs, although they haven't been vaccinated, the real driver here is that there weren't very many infected at weaning, so that infection occurred late. Where we had high rates of infection, we had early infection, and, and right, they kind of started to clear the, clear the organism by market. Think about cost. This might be more costly, this high, prop, this high infection rate, than the low infection rate with respect to our ability to manage a disease. So there was another thing that was interesting. So, Darren talked a lot about sow vaccination with PCV, and so there's been this discussion around should we or should we not vaccinate sows for mycoplasma? Is that a way to reduce this transmission? So they were shocked, and this is out of the discussion. They were shocked that they had all this infection rate in these pigs pre-weaning because there had been another series of studies done that said, well, if we vaccinate in five and three weeks pre-farrowing, we didn't have as much infection post-weaning. Now, what's important to notice is look at the dates on these studies. We're at 03, 07, 08. This was some work done in 2000, uh, actually done in 2010, published in 11. Our diagnostics got a lot better, folks. We were able to detect things better here. And so we really have to question all this old work with older diagnostic methodologies. Is what was the real sensitivity of that? And did we really truly know their status? This gets back to this whole conundrum for us at the time of weaning. Is weaning pigs something we can really monitor? So we had this brilliant proposal we were going to put together to monitor weaned pigs uh, with Maria Peters. Got into it, decided our best samples were nasal swabs. She was piloting a, a similar project on another set of farms. She said, well, let's get through that before we go jump off the cliff here. We can't find it. Does that mean it's not there? No, it means that our sample, antemortem samples aren't very good to give us acumen estimates of prevalence. And if we think about trying to pick up a 10 to 20% difference in prevalence, we could have a lot of samples with a high degree of sensitivity. And it appears the available diagnostic tests today directly on wean pigs aren't good enough to allow us to do that. So, 
Seville, you did include that, that disinfection is important. But the question then becomes, how do we measure it? So, I'm going to propose that if we can fix these gilts, we can probably solve mycoplasma. And this part of the story is almost exactly identical to the story you've heard about PERS and you heard about PCV2. These young critters coming into the herd, and because of their exposure and their immunological status, et cetera, et cetera, and when they're exposed to these diseases, really does have a huge impact on overall sow herd stability and subsequently the stability of the weaned pigs. Right? And all we're really worried about is the stability of the weaned pigs, but I think the sow farm stability is a pretty good proxy for that. And if you look at the PCB data, it would suggest that. And I think the mycoplasma data starts to suggest that. So that tells us that there's probably a way we can get around that. And this last point is really important. We know from, from really some work out of Minnesota that these critters shed for at least 200 days. And they'll shed and gilts are the most likely ones to shed. So here's this data. This is Maria Peters' work, but these are pigs, 94 days post-infection. Basically, they can infect 100% of the sentinels. At 214 days post-infection, we've still got 50%. Sentinel testing may or may not be that sensitive. So we've got documented transmission, basically 50% of the animals, 200 days after they were intentionally exposed. Now, if I want to breed her at 200 days, and she's going to gestate another 115 days, that makes her 320, 325 days at farrowing, right? That means if I don't want her to be shedding at the time of farrowing, I've got to have her infected pretty darn early. Like, certainly less than 100 days of age. And that's where we've really tried to run into some challenges about how do we get that done. But I think we've got some things to talk about. So we said, how could we monitor this? And so this is two systems, let me orient you to this. This is two related systems, two related farms, excuse me, in, in unrelated systems. So this is the mean S to P ratio. This is their age. And so this is sow testing over here. This is pig testing over here. So these sows are tested quarterly. We tested gilts at entry, gilts mid-gestation, and sows mid-gestation. Okay. The theory was, because there are a way we can monitor the incoming animals, and so we've been beating this around for five or six years with various permutations, and this is really kind of the culmination of thought here that's actually quite good. So in this herd, what you've got is this give these nice high titers at the time of entry, the declining titers, right, in the gilts. So we're high, we're dropping off, and the sows appear to be relatively stable. You notice not much variation quarter to quarter. And then here's the downstream testing on the pigs, basically all negative. So it appears these animals are getting exposed young. Not a lot of activity here. And the sows aren't active either. And so the important thing to just remember is they do go antibody kind of negative, right? The antibodies decline over time if they're not re-exposed. So this data suggests to us, OK, this system looks pretty stable. This looks pretty good. That looks pretty good. And then let's look at farm two. So here we've got gilts that are basically kind of negative at entry. But man, do they go positive after that. So there's some activity here, right? Some of these are up above positive, right, as we think about progression. So we've got some positive, and maybe they're getting more positive because it actually goes oldest, middle, newest set of samples. But they all still seroconvert. And look at these sows and look at the variation in the sows. So I've got a relatively high degree of instability in antibody titers. What does that mean? Well, here's the downstream pigs. These pigs have a relatively high amount of seroconversion. Am I purporting this to be excellent? The ultimate cat's meow diagnostic test? No. It's got big limitations. But I think it starts to give us a bit of a hint in the field, so not in an applied study, not in a controlled study, but in the field, that we can maybe have some clue of what's going on at the south farm, understand if stability is there or stability is not there, and then design inter intervention strategies around that downstream. Right? So maybe we can do something to change when these gilts are infected. And we've tried that. I've not been very successful. 
but maybe that can happen and happen consistently. But if we can't do that, at least I can put pharmaceutical interventions in here. And I don't have to be beating pigs all the time or waiting for them to cough to make that decision. So if I know this, I know that I'm probably going to have to do some intervention, and that intervention may change. But it's a way for us to monitor, and if I'm commingling pigs, maybe I just separate this farm out, right? If these happen to be in the same flow. I will tell you in another project we did where we looked at a bunch of farms out of the same guilt developer, they all look the same. Very, very little variation when, when we have a common guilt source going into multiple sow farms. So this divergence, uh, these have to be different, different guilt developers here, but where you, if you don't have divergence, it's may not that big of a deal. So what does it all mean? I think it, if I want to get it better and wean to market pigs, and remember, that's the game. How do I get more pigs to town quicker at lower cost? I've got to lower that prevalence at weaning, and I've got to think about the dam as a source. Okay? And I'm going to argue that's the guilt. So this is the action points, right? Monitor, monitor, monitor. And I think there's some low-cost, easy monitoring. The samples you see there represent only 10 head. So it's not a significant expense. We believe, I think, um, I don't know why I say we. I didn't have to do any of the work on this one. I'm just stealing data. This is actually better. They believe would be the better opportunity. Would say that, you know, they're not even sure quarterly is necessary. If you look at the data, and I guess I would agree with that, it may be only every four months. So not a big expense to do that kind of monitoring. And then that allows us a chance to react, react and at least fix those things downstream. When I have those coughing pigs, they probably aren't the ones I need to look at. I probably need to go back upstream, and I may need to use some serological um, sampling to try to understand infection dynamics, understanding that serology is exceptionally limited in its sensitivity. But it may be better than having to euthanize a bunch of pigs and get BAL washes to try to understand PCR positives. And I think this second line here of investigating each case is a key word. I know we're all haggled, we're all busy, we all run around like chickens with our head cut off. But are we really working up all these cases to a level to try to understand all those cofactors so we make decisions that are there? And the last one, we're asking for help. Dale put up the, the PERS positive stability, or the PERS herd classification, the one through four stages. We think we need to do exactly the same thing for mycoplasma. And we think we probably need to do the other thing for flu. I, tend to, I will tell you a, a sad story. We tried it in flu, and they're all positive, so I gave up. They're all stage one. But I think mycoplasma, there's an opportunity for us to start to be able to describe herd stability and then hence build management strategies around what, those, what the, status of, those, what the um, status of that sow farm is for downstream management. So if all that said, right, <clears throat> excuse me, the cruise ship has still got me, right? I, this is, right, the SIR model. And we think about, you know, animals moving between these populations, and we think about SRD. And as veterinarians, we spend a lot of time thinking about therapeutics, and we spend a lot of time talking about immunoprophylaxis, and we may or may not, well, we talk about biosecurity. I don't know if we get it done, but that's another three-hour conversation. And I'm really sure we don't get infection control done, because even doctors don't get that right. But we don't talk very much about this and its real role. And I think this is the golden opportunity for us as veterinarians, because we've got a pretty unique set of skills with respect to understanding animal behavior and understanding people communication and understanding what actually happens every day on the farm. We're often the most educated person that shows up on the farm. And so what is our role in improving sick pig identification? Improving understanding at the caregiver level that, you know, they got to have a little bit of air, right? It gets back to this. Folks, this doesn't happen if this gets done. We get this done, all this other stuff goes away. I didn't believe that until I started looking at feedlot cattle. And trust me, they have every disease known to mankind. They don't even test them. They just know they got it. Right? They show up with the bucket. But you know what? The only thing that predicts our, our difference in mortality and case fatality rate, 
So that's the percent die those have treated. Is caregiver skill. How well do we do managing environment, getting feed in front of them, and making sure they got fresh water? This is our golden opportunity to make sure that we remain relevant if we can help our caregivers. And those people, that's the people in the barn, execute this on a daily basis because this will make a bigger impact on disease than anything else. So in quick summary here, I won't go over Tyler, I got 33 seconds. What you, see, what you see in finishing is a summary of what happened six to ten months ago in the South Farm. Okay? If you're worried about coughing pigs downstream, you've missed it by six or ten months. So understanding that breeding herd is the first step to get that done. I think there's some monitoring tools that have been demonstrated up here that are really several years worth of work now that have, that have kind of culminated with that project that I think are fairly well validated that I think we can now monitor sow herds and feel very good about where we're at. How we match those gilts. I've said before I'm not a huge fan of mycoplasma negative gilts because if I got to put mycoplasma negative gilts into a, per, into a mycoplasma positive herd, how do I get that done? Because I can't intentionally infect them. So we got to think about matching those things up and creating the stability model. And finally, vaccines are not the solution, nor are they the problem but they're one of the tools in our bucket that we need to employ.